confinement. We would like to avoid that because we are living now, not yesterday or tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow we shall deal with the middle of luck. This is the concern. Some of my friends in the climate change affair, they do think that we have already entered into the irreversible climate change zone. So unless we do something to penetrate and liquidate the carbon dioxide blanket, it will be darkness all around very soon. When I say soon, don't worry about your life. I don't see very old or very young people, excuse me, we are all pretty old, we don't have to worry about it. But our generation, generation after that, or the generation even after that, have to be very careful. Energy facts has been given before. It's amazing, you know. United States of America is twice the UK and consumption of energy, and about 50 times Bangladesh. It's an extraordinary. I wouldn't say statistics, a fact. The fact that the engine that revs in a spotlight, stoplight, all the engines to stop in the stoplight of America will feed India for one full day, energy-wise. This is the Human Development Index, the most mysterious index I have ever come across. Red spots are the developed countries, generally speaking, and the blue spots are underdeveloped. India is somewhere in the below beginning of the axis. King of Bhutan, of all people, has one wonderful contribution in the Human Development Index. Internationally, has managed to put in human happiness. If you ask me what human happiness is, I was a sorry man, I just don't know. Those who think they're very happy, the mob will be very unhappy people. And those who think very unhappy, they may be very happy. The happiness is a very qualitative concept, but King of Bhutan introduced that as a criterion of human development index. Source of energy, I don't know how to say it again, 80% burning of fossil fuel. Fossil fuel would die out one day, then what do you do? 10% burning combustible renewables and waste, 5% nuclear altogether, 5% hydro, 0.5% geothermal solar. I'd like to emphasize on the geothermal part, because India has scored a fantastic number on the geothermal, although adequate scope for our experience. My colleagues are sitting there, and they know it very well. This is near Bokreshwa, about 20 or 30 kilometers from Shantaniketan. There is a hot spring, natural hot spring, and from there, the gas that comes out has got a fair amount of helium. And all along the Indian peninsula in the middle, from Bokreshwa to Kutch, there are the springs hanging around because of geological history. And you can utilize that in terms of so-called geothermal energy. Solar potential, I don't have to emphasize that. Let me emphasize enough. It is incredibly misused, unused potential. All I want to say, 0.2% of the Sahara Desert can supply the energy required by Earth for part day, one day. I mean, it's just amazing. Like United Nations, a fond dream is to have a solar forum, but this forum decides how much in energy, electricity, should one get from the solar power, depending on the GDP, for instance. That's a far cry. In India, we have been talking about, in these rooms like this, solar power, but in my humble opinion, progress has been business, absolutely terrible. Although, India is a country where there is no dearth of solar energy. Professor from Jadapur is here, my friend. I mentioned this word again and again. Some of you probably know the cow is a very important animal. Not only produces milk, 
which produces dung, the cow dropping. And from the droppings you may bhute, dry up the whole dung, and that is the source of renewable energy on earth or especially in this part of the world. Interesting that our renewable energy concept remains and has remained in that. This is a mix of the present India's mix. It's too complicated, I won't go into detail. But you see here, again, the thermal is very high. Now comes the geothermal, which is supposed to be my topic. These arrows are fictitious arrows, in the sense it's just to draw your attention. As expected, the United States has the highest geothermal power. And geothermal doesn't cost you anything. Mother Earth has produced the heat in the belly of her. Like a lady in a room has a child, Mother Earth has the heat inside her belly. All you have to do is to tap the belly of Mother Earth and then produce the steam from water which you pump in from the top and there comes the gas, there comes the hot steam, hot steam and from there comes the electricity. It's extremely simple and cheap. As far as I know, almost pollution free, not entirely 100%, almost. Look at that. Way back in 1920s, 2,800 megawatt in Italy, they produced geothermal. As recently, 2005, Alsace in France produced geothermal. However, if you compare geothermal to other, I won't go into details, but it's one of the cheapest way of doing it compared to solar, to hydro, to nuclear, to wind. In terms of renewable energy source, geothermal probably is one of the most useful. We have tried our best government. You see, government is like an inertia of doing nothing. We tried very hard, central government. The Ministry of this, Ministry of that. But they don't seem to think that geothermal is very important. And the reason they give is quite remarkable. It has not been proved before. It has not been proved before, it's about time we prove it, damn it. But they don't, do not seem to be very keen to give us any money in terms of exploding the solar power in that peninsula. India has more than 300 hot springs. Geothermal access is the source. And the estimated value of geothermal power is 10,000 megawatt. It's not a joke. And this is the minimum conservative estimate. In India, the utilization of geothermal energy is so confined to pilot plants only. And there was one pilot plant in Leh, and there was a fantastic gale, a natural disaster. That was the end of the program. I call upon you, these very learned people, to take up this issue, because it's the mother earth which is giving it to you free, on her own hand, sweet hand. They're sitting there doing nothing about it. It's a shame. You saw those numbers in the United States when there are so much of energy. Still, they've got 1,20,000 plus megawatt from Joseph. This is the peninsula I'm talking about. That's the Bokris, which is bipping near Shantiniketan. Right the way to the belly of India goes up to Kutch and all that. So imagine this entire area can be used for geothermal purposes if you put our mind into it. Homi Jehangir Bhava, when he actually put forward the idea to nuclear power in just independent India, then Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru said, Homi, you must be out of your mind. A country where there is only bullock cart as part of a so-called transfer of goods and so on. You want to make a nuclear power station? I know Parsi is a little wanky, but you're completely mad. But it becomes good for the country. I mean, it's obvious that nuclear power stations are a necessity, like any other power stations of any kind, to meet the energy sources of our country today. Because whether you like it or not, energy is a progressing country. India is a progressing country. What it requires energy is a large scale. Why are you going to get it? Nuclear is one of them. So that's one peninsula. 
The other one is below that. The idea is to explore that and develop geothermal energy for that part of central region of India. This is a picture to divert your attention of Bakreshwara, where the water is hot, it's 70 degrees centigrade, and natural gas has got 1.8% helium, and helium is used for all kinds of purposes. At the moment, there is a tremendous crisis of helium because helium, America has stopped supplying helium to India. So all our superconducting project, including superconducting cyclotron in BECC, I work, or for instance in terms of the instruments that we use for MRI and so on, and indeed anything to do with nuclear power stations or spacecraft, we need helium. And helium is not a very short supply. And this idea is to explore the possibility of helium in that area that I showed in the graph. But in India it is an ancient country. Whatever there is something which is peculiar, like 72 degrees centigrade hot water, rice is not getting boiled, but something mysterious. Temples come out all over the place. You can't see behind the gas storage there is temples. Conclusion is energy challenge already said so, but there is no challenge and no solution at the moment, whatever people say, to solve the problem of carbon dioxide totally. Each time you burn a chulli with carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide has a very long lifetime, believe it or not. And that is a serious problem, because once the poles are there, you see you now it is the carbon dioxide emissions and GDP per capita. USA as for example at the top, India right at the bottom on the left hand side. We don't produce that much of carbon dioxide. So it seems you said sir correctly, of course, the production of electricity is proportional to prosperity of a country. Ironically and cynically I would say CO two emission is also practically done. Progress. Alas. You can see from the graph. During the last two and a half years, the average rate of earthquakes because of climate change increased and this trend in the history there was earthquake. So frequently, and believe it or not, when tsunami happened, I must confess my ignorance, I never heard the word tsunami. Tsunami is a Japanese name. An <coughs> increase in average rate of earthquakes may well be due to climate change. If you draw a graph before 1000 AD and now, there's an enormous increase in increase in terms of tsunami in this, in this, in this Madara. That means you have really messed up the whole Madara. She's angry. We think we're very good. We're very content to be what we're doing. We're concerning about our next generation, generation after that. This is a shocking picture of the poor. Oh, you can see there's a small black dot. My joke is because of photographic techniques or whatever, the polar bear has become black because of the heat. But think about the heat on the polar cap. Ice would melt. That means there will be more absorption of heat because it will not reflect out of the ice. And that means there were more heating and there were more heat. So no way you can escape this heating problem, as it were. The polar bear, it seems to me, are sad and distressful. So what are the sources of clean energy? I believe it has to be nuclear to some extent. We have to be very careful, feel safe, and um, I'm just looking forward to this hydropower, renewable energy, geothermal, I talked about wind and biomass and solar, I don't have time. That was the Sahara. In fact, we don't even have electricity produced from the solar power of our own desert in the north. Well, I've taken a ride quickly and my time is up. 
probably you need to know some more numbers, more statistics, and so on and so forth. If you like, I can supply some equations also to make your life really miserable. And I will say, thank you very much for your kind attention to this display. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, imagine the kind of uh, fresh outlook that he has brought. I mean, you are talking about the energy from the top and energy from the bottom, uh, from the earth, Mother Earth. I think if we are able to harmonize these two things, uh, synergy will always happen between energy and climate. Thanks so once again, sir, for such a lovely presentation. Uh, now what I'll do is that, uh, I'm taking over and then we'll come back. So, uh, Shirish uh, will talk about his uh, kind of uh, view on this feasibility or the reality of this 170 gigabytes. Uh, would you like to go there? Thank you. I would like to keep some time for an interaction here. So, therefore, uh, uh, Shirish, if you can finish it in 10 minutes, then yeah, 10 minutes, uh, next yes. speaker, then we'll have good time for an yeah. interactive session. Thank you. Uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Chairperson, and also thanks to BCCI uh, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I think uh, uh, everything which can be said has been more or less said about the problems, about the issues, uh, both for renewables and Dr. Sonde covered a little bit about other applications of renewable other than solar and how this, uh, you know, one can go for a comprehensive uh, kind of thing. <clears throat> I would like to mention a uh, few things. First is having said that we need to do and we are doing. So I would like to highlight a couple of things which we are trying to do and to make this perspective, to make it happen. And uh, to start with what I feel is uh, thermal energy. I think uh, Dr. Sonde very clearly brought out that uh, thermal energy is an important segment of energy and what we are using is basically uh, you know all the oil or coal and uh, that is one of the major source of pollution and there are some innovative uh, technologies uh, disruptive technologies which are likely to come or which are probably are coming uh, because uh, and that is uh, something which is uh, thermal storage or storage of cold <coughs> or cool energy <coughs> and this is something which we are trying to develop at Terry uh, we have established center for excellence on thermal storage uh, because thermal storage can also help you in balancing grid <coughs> by using electricity during the night for developing the cold storage that means store uh, generate the cool and store it <coughs> sorry and use it during the daytime when you need cooling because as you mentioned majority of our electricity consumption in buildings and buildings consume about 40 percent of our electricity is going for cooling particularly in country like India you know hot country and this cooling load is uh, is go, uh, you know increasing day by day as our li living standards are increasing and that is also affecting grid management so if one can start uh, storing the cool and use it in the night uh, i mean uh, uh, use the electricity in the night when thermal power stations can generate uh, and uh, that time electricity is cheap so that is one area which I feel is the solution, uh, you know, um, uh, which can bring in the solution. The second area is, of course, microgrids. And uh, with help of, uh, you know, Australian and Indian government support, we have already started developing smart microgrids, uh, which can talk to the load, which can talk to the uh, sources that you may have biomass gasifier, you may have solar PV, you can have grid or you can have even DG set as a backup. So managing the electricity through intelligent control system which will you know manipulate the load, which will manipulate the sources based on their availability and the cost of electricity which they can give. Uh, so microgrids may be at village level 
uh, at cluster of village or maybe at block level and then getting integrated into the main grid. So this is one area we, where uh, we are also working and CAC also uh, has given us a good uh, you know uh, perspective of that. Now uh, what happens with this kind of technologies is uh, you, you are getting into a more efficient use of uh, technology and you are using a modern day technologies. <coughs> so in the intelligent control systems, uh, I think it is not something which is undoable with current level of technologies and it is happening. So these are the couple of areas. A third area is of course biofuels uh, where DME or methanol technology uh, because you already have IC engine, uh, you know internal combustion engine uh, industry which is already there. So if it can switch from petrol or diesel to some other fuel then probably that is more beneficial than switching over completely to some other uh, you know uh, fuel or uh, energy input. So that is one area where we are again uh, you know focusing on and uh, this is something which I thought is uh, worth mentioning because uh, that is where uh, there is a good scope of uh, replacing uh, current uh, fuels uh, with sustainable fuels, uh, fuels which can be managed. <coughs> And uh, last, I would like to say that um, all the, uh, what all important is political will and public awareness. I think the, uh, today technology are there, money can come in, markets can be developed and what is required is political will. If politi politicians are ready and then uh, 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 to bring out the proper policies and regulations and I would like to give one example uh, of Bhutan. Uh, we did uh, energy management, uh, integrated energy management plan for Bhutan in 2005 and it started with you know looking at energy consumption patterns in the domestic sector, in industrial sector, in uh, a commercial buildings, how the economy is developing and how the economy will go and what will be the you know kind of requirements and how they can fill in. Now interestingly what we found that the country has hardly any industries, it basically tourism is one of the its major source of income which is I mean but they have very restricted tourism they don't allow tourists to come more certain uh, you know certain number only per year is allowed but they are charged heavily but because of the pristine environment because of the you know mysterious and uh, you know environment and then the, the tradition and all there are a good number of uh, tourists coming to this country. So this major source of pollution was cooking fuel because it is mostly fuel wood and vehicles which are basically diesel driven or petrol driven. So we thought of course building energy efficiency you know improving energy efficiency solar PV and all was given but two suggestions we gave and one of them they were already practicing is use of electrical uh, cookers for cooking because all their electricity is through small hydro. So it, there is neither uh, generation pollution nor there is a pollution at the user point. And uh, so they again they, they came out with uh, so giving additional subsidy for electrical cook, cook stoves or electrical cooking, induction cooking and all. The second was electric, uh, you know, we thought we, you, why don't you try electric uh, vehicles that is the electric cars at least as an experimental basis and that time only Reva was the only electrical vehicle available in this part of the world and uh, we asked uh, Reva to supply two vehicles. During that period I think Reva was, Reva was taken over by Mahindra's <coughs> after that and they refused because they said no this is not a market we don't see it market, we don't have service support, we don't want, we, this is not on our marketing plan and so on and so forth. I said if we want to buy two vehicles, what service support you want to create, we will train the people from government of there. And 
the whole you know whole uh, thing uh, took about one year to convince them to sell two vehicles to government of bhutan but trust me they used these vehicles for two two years they they got some more vehicles and then they they made a national policy now and they want to switch over all the transportation at least uh, to the level of uh, you know smaller four wheelers uh, to electric vehicles now this is what a political will can do this is what a public can do and uh, now they are in talks with companies like nissan or all to how to you know implement this plan in a more cost effective manner now the second example we have a couple of examples i can give you is the led lights now led lights uh, led bulbs when they came in the market they were around 700 800 rupees and which is very expensive but the esl through esl government of india came out with a massive market creation mechanism bulk purchase mechanism and the prices started dropping down and today it is hardly about 50 rupees or so and the same concept in solar the uh, you know uh, 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 india has uh, you know booted for the national international solar alliance now what this alliance is alliance of all the countries which are under the solar belt which have maximum solar radiation the idea is to create a common market to have maybe standard specifications or standard market requirements so that the new technologies which essentially are investing in research or development want to get returns faster look at that big market so that they can bring out the products at much cheaper rate than otherwise now this brings in faster development of the technologies because market creation is also very fast and also faster deployment of technologies so what we took uh, from uh, 1980s uh, when uh, you know we started doing solar uh, uh, say street light and solar home lighting systems to 2008 or 10 it was hardly 2 megawatt or so and suddenly you will find the mere announcement of 20 gigawatt and then 100 gigawatt of solar itself brought in huge change in the market huge change in the perception of the people huge change in the perception of investors or technology developers so i think creating that kind of you know impulse creating that kind of market uh, you know uh, vision itself is a political tool sherish sherish two minutes yeah yeah, yeah. so i think these these are the uh, you know uh, issues or these are the ways one can really take renewables or any other clean technologies uh, to uh, you know to the scale which is required and look at replacing conventional uh, fossil fuel technologies with cleaner technologies and a cleaner and better future for us thank you thank you shirish uh, shri ram uh thanks to bangalore Chim chamber of bengal chamber of commerce i am from bangalore <laughs> thank you for uh, bengal chamber of commerce and you know fantastic panel sitting here uh for the invite and um, 